In this video, I'm going to be telling you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about Duncan Rhodes' Two Thin Coats paint range. Now, we're not going to do anything scientific like side-by-side -side comparisons. We're going to see this paint in its natural environment, which is painting a miniature, and boy, what a miniature it is. The brand new Horus Ascended model from Forge World. He is an absolute stunner, covered in detail, and perhaps maybe one too many skulls. Now, for full disclosure, I reached out to Transatlantis Games and they very kindly sent me the full set of two thin coats paints that are currently available to buy at all good local gaming stores. Now, they've given me carte blanche in this review, they haven't asked me to do anything specific, and they haven't seen it before it goes live. To make things even more difficult for myself and possibly for you to watch, so apologies for that, this is the first time I've ever used these paints they've been in the box i've taken them out of the box i've started using them there's been no practice so this is going to make painting horus a little bit of a challenge now as we go through this i will talk about citadel and how these paints compare to them because that's what i know best that's what i predominantly use on the channel so without any further ado let's get painting the first thing I've noticed is there is quite a bit of separation on some of the colours, in particular the metallics. Now, luckily the balls all come with agitators already in them. Um, it's a quick trip to the Vortex Mixer for me. I want to save my uh, my poor wrist and my arms. Uh, and after that, they seem to be looking a lot better. Now, if you want to follow along with this scheme and you've only got Citadel paints, then the team have included this handy paint conversion chart, which you can find online as well. It does also include Army Painter. Now, I'm not judging you if you use Army Painter, but they're not my favourite paints. I've pulled a few pots at random out of the box and put them onto my wet palette. Now, my first impression is that they are rather thick straight out of the bottle. Now, this could be due to the density of pigments. So, for example, Chimera colours are very similar, as an example. Uh, it could be that I haven't shaken them long enough or they haven't spent long enough on the Vortex Mixer. Or it could be that they've just been sat in this box for a while uh, and need a little bit more motion in their ocean. Now, adding a touch of water seems to thin them quite nicely. The first thing I've done on Horus himself is painted him with some thinned Doom Death Black. This is just to unify the armour colours so that if I do make any mistakes later on and want to repair them, all the black will look the same. Uh, look at how this goes on. It's quite hard to tell, but it does seem to cover better than the bad and black. It does thin a little bit better than the bad and black as well, um, which could be a bit of a game changer going forward. Let's get on to the metallics as our first real port of call then. So I firstly based all of the silver with Sir Coat Silver. Now this is one of those colours that came out of the pot a little thick and lumpy, uh, even after some emotional support from the Vortex Mixer. A touch of water sorted that out, and you can see that it covers okay, about the same as Lead Belcher from Citadel, in fact. I can see it now that this paint is literally going to live up to its name of two thin coats. Jumping into the washes to add some shading, like my first real disappointment with this paint range. Despite a good shake and Vortex Tango, the Oblivion Black wash didn't do it for me at all. It felt quite gel-like in its consistency and didn't flow particularly well into the recesses. Nevertheless, I persevered and it dried fairly well, although it just seemed to have dulled things down rather than effectively shaded them. I may well be too used to Null Oil from Citadel, although in fairness I am talking about the old formulation of Null Oil, which I do like a lot more than the new one. Next up, I highlighted the silver using Mithril Blade. Now, it'll take a lot, lot, lot to take the crown of chrome from Valeo Model Air, uh, but this does a fairly good job. Again, the paint was a little thick coming out and thinning it to the right consistency with water was a little bit of a challenge to make sure that it didn't flow off the brush too much. But I got there in the end and I'm quite happy with the result. With all the silver completed, let's move on to the gold, of which there is so much. So much gold. I started off with a base of Spartan Bronze, which is very similar to Balthazar Gold in colour, but it's actually a much nicer paint to use. And it does feel a lot smoother. Again, I needed two coats to get even coverage, but that was fairly easy to achieve. The two thin coats range is designed in a triad format, so that you have shadow, midtone, and highlight for every colour. This is great in theory, but I had some small issues with how close some of the colours are, and I'll flag this as we move forward. With that in mind, I wasn't convinced going straight to Dragon's Gold was going to give me the contrast I wanted, so I covered all the gold with the flesh wash from the set. This is thicker than something like Right Down Flesh Shade and had similar qualities to the black wash earlier, but this one was much nicer to use. When that was dry, I had a nice surface to go on to using Dragon's Gold, the Retributor Armour equivalent, and this was also very nice to use. It went on really well and gave a very nice rich gold, and in all honesty, I actually really enjoyed seeing the model start to come alive. The final highlight was with Glistening Gold, and this really needed a trip on the Vortex Mixer. This paint had the most separation out of all of them, but following good seeing too, it came out fine. 
Applying it was also a lot of fun, and I think one of the best bits as I applied this was seeing the shine and reflection catching the light. I was really happy with this finish and impressed with the golds available in this set. I highly recommend them. Now, I've shown a lot of ways to paint black armor on this channel, so I was really keen to tackle this next. Not least because I've got a 2,000 point black Templar army hiding in a box somewhere. I mean, come on, who hasn't got that? So, I first started looking for something of the equivalent that I would use such as Dark Reaper, Thunderhawk Blue, and then Finerizine Grey on the Citadel colours. But I couldn't see anything until I came across what I will now call the Space Wolf Equivalency. Whilst this sounds fancy, it is nothing more than using Cold Corpse Blue to start the edge highlighting. This is meant to be like the Fang, but I found it less blue and more like a Dark Reaper, which is absolutely perfect. One of the things I really liked about this paint, and indeed all of the Space Wolf Equivalency, was how smooth and consistently it went on and how good the coverage was. I continued building up those highlights with wolf grey next, and again the smoothness and consistency of the coat really impressed me. I didn't feel like I was fighting the paint like I do sometimes with Citadel. So for example, it can be quite lumpy on the pad even after you thin it down, and then when you go to the model, the coverage isn't fantastic. The final highlight was done using gravestone blue, meant to be an equivalent of Fenrisian grey, and again slightly less blue in tone for me. This really helped though as the final highlight wasn't as stark, and I think it came out nicely across the model. I'm really looking forward to using these paints on other models that aren't horror, something more simple like a, a normal primary space meme, because I think it'll look really good. We'll move on to bigger and brighter things next, and there's no bigger part of this model than that massively bright red cloak the horse is wearing. So let's see if we can do it justice with these new paints. The first in the red triad is Berserker Red, and this is actually quite a brownie red that reminded me of Doom Ball Brown, actually. And it covered fantastically well. I was really impressed with this paint and I really loved the coverage. I added the first highlight using Sanguine Scarlet and was immediately put off by how this went down in comparison to the first coat. The paint didn't look like such a big jump in value on the palette and this didn't apply as nicely and as smoothly as the base coat. But I needn't have worried however as when the colour dried it blended really nicely into the base coat and all my worries disappeared. It actually looks quite good for absolutely minimal effort of painting one paint over another. I moved to highlighting with Demon Red and this felt like it was probably one colour too bright as a highlight colour. Which goes back to what I was saying earlier about the triad system having unequal jumps in colour value. The Demon Red went on fine but did need a second coat. I did a final highlight with Fanatic Orange which reminded me of Troll Slayer Orange from Citadel. Uh, just as well, really, as this is exactly what the conversion chart said it was. Uh, and overall, this red cloak was nice, but I wanted to try and blend it together a little better. So try to make a glaze of Demon Red and Sanguine Red. Um, I say try, as they're very pigment-rich paint, so I really struggled to get them down to glaze consistency. I could have spent a much longer time doing this if I wanted. Uh, but working in lots of thin layers, it did help me blend these colours together a little bit better. But it did start to get me thinking about, well, who were these paints for? I think these paints are predominantly designed for the Wargamer, uh, not necessarily the display paint. I'm not sure you can use them for that. The pigmentation, the coverage, it, I think it's just all geared to getting lots of models done to a good standard fairly quickly. And that's fine by me. And actually, it's really inspiring me to think, well, actually, I can pick up some of my other armies I've abandoned uh, and I can actually crack on and get them finished, which is a win. So I'm going to tackle the non-metallic metal on the cloak next. So it's non-metallic gold. Now, I am not the best person in the world to teach you how to paint non-metallic metals. It's not something I spend a lot of time learning, but luckily there's a very pretty picture on the Games Workshop website which shows us where all the highlights and the shadows need to be, so I'm going to follow that. Uh, the only problem I've got is I haven't a clue what colours I'm going to use. On an absolute wing and a prayer, I based all of the non-metallic metal effects with cuirass leather. It's a nice colour to kick on from and again went on nicely with a little water added. I then took a chance and mixed about 50-50 of the cuirass leather and dark sun yellow, which gave me a really nice desaturated yellow that kind of, sort of, looked like something I can work with. Now, this had a decent amount of transparency as well, which really helped when choosing where to add more layers to build up the brightness and leaving the darker colours in the recesses. I then moved to pure dark sun yellow, focusing on those areas that needed highlighting. The paint again would need two coats to cover fully, but I used this to my advantage. To start highlighting, I added in a little vampire fang, and this is possibly one of the lumpiest paints I used. The coverage wasn't fantastic either between these two, which is fine for what I was doing, but maybe when we're painting other materials, this might not be ideal. 
I then went straight up to Vampire Fang, and despite another trip around the world on the Vortex Mixer, it was still very lumpy with poor coverage, which is a shame and probably my second biggest disappointment with this paint range. I finished the non-metallic metal with a spot hide of White Star, no prizes for guessing the Stadel equivalent, and also by glazing some boar hide, uh, a reddy brown, into the deepest recess to just to help that transition from the dark brown to the yellow. Overall, I am fairly satisfied with how that non-metallic metal has turned out, uh, particularly considering I didn't have a clue what I was doing or where I was going. The last big colour group we'll have a look at is the flesh tones. Firstly, I based the face with Barbarian Brawn. Now, this went on really nicely over the black, but it did need those uh, two thin coats, as we expect to get a decent coverage. I want to use the triad system to its full effect, so rather than shade this with a wash, I'm just going to move straight on to Dwarven Skin. Now, this covered pretty nicely in one coat, and I started to focus on the raised areas, leaving the Barbarian Brawn in the recesses, and then when this dried, very much like the red, it settled into the base coat, leaving a really nice transition. I added Elven Skin next, and this worked nicely as well. It helped highlight the features, but I did realise that in the case of this triad, again, they're quite similar and close in value when they've dried down into each other. So to try and offset this a little, I added some ivory tusk and highlighted the extreme edges, such as the nose, the cheekbones, the brow, before then going in with pure ivory tusk as a spot highlight to really help the face stand out. To represent the inner glow, from Horus's armour, I glazed some demon red over the face. Once again, I found that this was really too powerful and I hadn't thinned it down enough or I had too much on my brush, so I did have to clear quite a bit off as it was just too powerful. So, with the majority of Horus now complete, let's talk about some of the other colours in the set I used just to finish everything off and make it look nice. The greys were nice, if unspectacular, not much between these and Citadel, and Mechanica standard grey is always such a standout paint. They did, however, dry brush nicely, though, and I was able to create some nice texture on the stonework, although how much of this was technique or paint is probably up for debate. Similarly, the greens were okay. They probably covered better than Citadel, and the big plus for me, as with the majority of those paints over Citadel, was the control and consistency of application that makes painting a really good experience. I was a little disappointed with the bone colours in the set, going back again to that colour triad. I think they were all quite close together once they dried, um, and they probably could have had a little bit of contrast between them all. Uh, I could have gone back in and highlighted them further uh, up to another level, but I need to get over the trauma of painting all these first uh, before I go back and do that. The yellows and oranges were also great. When painting those eyes across the armour, they went on really nicely and smoothly, and again, were better than Citadel in application and coverage. Now, I didn't get the chance to use the blues or the purples, so I'll hold judgement on them until another project comes around that needs them. Um, so what else do we need to consider? First up, the two thin coats comes in a 15ml drop bottle with the agitator already in there, which is a massive bonus. This is slightly bigger than the standard 12ml pot that you'll get from Citadel. Of course, the other advantage in that dropper bottle is the flat caps on the Citadel paints attract dried paint like a dumpster attracts Nurgle. At recommended retail price, two thin coats are £3.95, while Citadel is £3.50. Now, two thin coats comes in about 26 pence per milliliter, while Citadel comes in at 29 pence per milliliter, so even your two thin coats has the edge a little. Looking at the wider market, however, you can get something like AK Interactive third gen acrylics for an RRP of £2.94 for a 17 mil pot, or a very attractive 17 pence per mil. So in the wider market, there is certainly some competition at that price point. There is also the smaller range. Now, of course, Citadel, Vallejo, AK have massive paint ranges. They've also got lots of different types of paint. So I'm thinking about, you know, contrast paints. I think about some of the basing paints, oil paints, etc. that all these companies have got going. Now, I know that Two Thin Coats, their second Kickstarter is not long finished, and there's going to be a lot of new paints coming from that. And I'm really excited to try them out when they're released, because I think some of the greens are going to be fantastic for painting things like Astra Militarum. So with all that in mind, what are my final thoughts on two thin coats? First, let's bask in the glory of Horus Ascended now complete. I'm really happy with how he turned out, especially as I was using a brand of paints for the first time. Overall, I really enjoyed using the two thin coat set of paints. I can easily recommend them to anyone in the hobby, especially those starting out. They're very much geared towards army painting. I think that is where I'm going to get most of the use out of them.
These paints, they're not the cheapest on the market, but I do think they're good value because I think the quality is excellent. Even on those ones which are a bit lumpy, you can thin them really nicely. When it comes to painting them on the Mini, the majority of them are really good in terms of their consistency and their coverage, meaning you can get more done in less time. If you want to pick up some of these paints, then please go and support your local gaming store if they stock them. If not, check out the link in my description for Element Games where you can get them there and I get a small kickback at no cost to you. If you have any questions or queries about the paints, then let me know in the comment section and I will answer them as quickly as I can. I really hope you enjoyed this review. I really hope you found it useful. Please do check out my other content. I've got loads of tutorial videos on the channel. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you next time.